In this video, you're going to learn about what circadian biologists call a phase response curve, or PRC. A PRC is a graphical representation of how an organism's response to a stimulus, especially a stimulus which is a zeitgeber, varies as a function of the phase of circadian time at which the stimulus is applied. In this video, we're going to presuppose that you're familiar with the concept of a zeitgeber and the concept of circadian time. If these don't sound familiar, you should go revisit the previous video in this series before proceeding. We're also going to presuppose that you are familiar with actograms and free running periods. If that doesn't sound familiar, you should go back to the first video in this series. In order to introduce PRCs, let's suppose we're using the same individual organism in five experiments. We do one experiment after another. The actograms for these five experiments are labeled here as A, B, C, D, and E. In the first stage of all these experiments, we entrain the organism to a light-dark cycle. In the next stage of all the experiments, we're going to remove the LD cycle, putting the organism into constant darkness. In all five experiments, the organism exhibits roughly the same free-running period. In this example, it always exhibits an FRP of greater than 24 hours. Now we're going to do something different in each of the five experiments. While our organism is free-running in DD, we're going to apply an acute stimulus, that is, a stimulus of brief duration. Let's suppose that in each experiment, we expose the organism to 15 minutes of light, marked here with a yellow box. As you can see, in this experiment, we're going to vary when in this objective day the organism is exposed to the light. Let's discuss each case from left to right. In experiment A, the organism is exposed to light at several hours before onset of activity. In experiment B, the organism is exposed to light just barely before onset of activity. In experiment C, the organism is exposed to light just a bit after onset of activity. In experiment D, the organism is exposed to light just a short while before the end of their active period. In experiment E, the organism is exposed to light right at the very end of their active period. This slide shows the crucial information which underwrites the whole PRC. Even though our experiments all involve the same organism, and even though it was initially entrained to the same LD cycle, and even though it was always then put into DD and free running, and even though in all experiments the organism was given a pulse of light with the same basic properties, nonetheless the organism responds very differently to the pulse of light depending on when in circadian time the light was applied. In experiment A, the organism shows little response to the pulse. In experiment B, the organism shows a slight phase delay in response to the pulse. In experiment C, the organism shows a greater phase delay. In experiment D, the organism shows a large phase advance. In experiment E, the organism shows a smaller phase advance. A phase response curve is a way of quantitatively representing these kinds of data in a clear way. Let's shrink down these data so that we have some space to build a phase response curve. We've just seen that depending on the phase of subjective time in which an organism receives a pulse, the organism's response to the pulse varies. To build a phase response curve, we're going to plot our data on a graph. This is the basic layout of the graph we will use. We're going to use the values on the x-axis to represent the phases of circadian time. We have subjective day, or CT 0 to 12, followed by subjective night, or CT 12 to 24. On the y-axis, we're going to represent phase advances using positive numbers, and we'll represent phase delays using negative numbers. The numbers correspond to the number of hours in circadian time that a rhythm can be advanced or delayed in response to a stimulus. Now we're ready to plot our data. First, we plot the results from experiment A. It might be tough to tell from the actogram, but the organism was exposed to the pulse of light right at around CT6. As you can probably tell from the actogram, there wasn't any effect on the organism's activity. So there wasn't any phase advance, and there wasn't any phase delay. So we plot the data from experiment A at 0 on the y-axis, and at CT6 on the x-axis. Now we do this for the data from all the other experiments. In experiment B, a pulse at CT12 produced a phase delay of about one hour. In experiment C, a pulse at about CT14 produced a large phase delay of about three hours. In experiment D, a pulse at CT20 produced a large phase advance of about four hours. And finally, in experiment E, a pulse at CT24 produced a smaller phase advance of about two hours. Once we've got all these data plotted, we can fit a curve to the data points. This is the phase response curve. The shape of the curve gives a visual representation of how a free-running organism responds to a single stimulus depending on the phase of circadian time in which the stimulus is applied. In our example here, we've built a curve for just one nocturnal organism, using light as our stimulus. 
but you can build PRCs for diurnal organisms as well. And you can build a general PRC for a whole population or a whole species of organisms by using data from many individuals. And you can build PRCs for stimuli besides light. But the basic shape you see here is a pretty standard shape for a PRC of any organism's response to light. And it allows us to make predictions about organisms that can help us create new experiments and explore how their clocks work. Let's highlight a few common features. First, throughout most of subjective day, it's not possible to produce either a phase advance or a phase delay. This is what's called the dead zone. You can generally predict that any free-running organism will fail to respond to a pulse of light during the middle of subjective day. Second, starting at the end of subjective day and continuing the first half of subjective night, it's possible to produce greater and greater phase delays up to a point. You can generally predict that if you want to phase delay any free-running organism using light, you're going to need to give it a pulse of light at some time during this phase. Third, starting after the middle of subjective night and continuing into subjective morning, it's possible to produce smaller and smaller phase advances. You can generally predict that if you want to phase advance any free-running organism using light, you're going to need to give it a pulse of light sometime during this phase. Finally, there's this part of the PRC in the middle of subjective night. The slope looks really steep, and it looks like there's a quick switch from large phase delays to large phase advances. In fact, the appearance of a gradual and continuous curve through this phase is misleading. It's an artifact. We draw it in just to get from the trough of the PRC up to its peak. You can't ever truly predict how a clock will react to a pulse of light in this phase. You might get a huge advance or a huge delay or anything in between. But when we draw PRCs, we tolerate this small bit of misleading information because the rest of the PRC is so useful for making predictions. In this video, we've mainly emphasized how to build a PRC from previous data. And we've also discussed a little bit how useful it is to know about the general shape of PRCs for a stimulus like light. If you know the basic shape of the PRC, you can make decent predictions about how new organisms can be phase advanced and phase delayed while free running. More importantly, if you have a good PRC for a species of organism, you can make very good predictions about how any individual of that species is likely to respond to a stimulus. That's it for this video on phase response curves.